最前沿的科学研究。Hello, everyone. We are back with a new episode today. This is Mehdi, and this is Shen, and we are the co-hosts of your favorite scientific podcast, where we dive deeply into new scientific innovations. Okay, Shen, tell us about our guest today. So, our guest today is neuroscientist and author Rodrigo Kian Quiroga. Although originally from Argentina, he has studied or worked in the U.S., Germany, Japan, the Netherlands, Italy. And in his home country of Argentina, as a list of such diverse countries may suggest, Quiroga's interests are heavily interdisciplinary, with his neuroscience background leading him to blend the words of science fiction, neuroscience, and philosophy. So here's more from Professor Quiroga about how he came to neuroscience. Yeah, I'm Rodrigo Can Quiroga. I'm a neuroscientist. I didn't start as a neuroscientist, so I, I'm from Argentina. So I started. Uh, studying physics in Argentina, and then I did a PhD in applied math in Germany, and then at some point I moved to Caltech I, to take a slow and fellowship, and then I started neuroscience. And now, since I don't know, 15 years or so, I'm I'm in England and I'm the head of the Center for System Neuroscience in the University of Leicester. Well, what drew you to neuroscience? Oh, um, curiosity. I. I was always fascinated about the brain, and I was working on, on applied math and also dynamical systems, and statistical mechanics. But when I moved to Caltech, I really wanted to get to to study neurons and to try to figure out different aspects of how the brain works. And I thought that's that's a fascinating thing to do in science. I think I'm very good at doing what I like to do, and I think that's key. So, for example, I really got passionate about. This book, when I was writing this book, and I really like science fiction, and basically the type of things I'm doing now as a scientist is try to follow what I found really intriguing from these science fiction movies. So this kind of like writing this book, the process of writing this book really dragged me into try to understand what makes us humans. And now my career, my scientific career, is more, I mean, twisted in, in, into this direction. I'm doing experiments to try to. To prove this point, whereas before I was more following a path, looking for how memories are coded and so on, which is very important and is is crucial. So I'm still doing that, but I'm, I'm I think I lost I lost fear to to attack like like interesting questions. I mean I I like to follow my passion, and if it is not what I will should should be doing, if it maybe we waste wasting my time, if I will get nothing at the end. I really don't care much because I mean, who will take away the fun that I had by by trying? <laughs> so over the course of this episode, we'll be delving into several of Professor Kiroga's recent projects spanning his new book covering sci-fi, philosophy, and neuroscience. Yes, you heard me correctly. He gets into them all, as well as his well-known research on the famous Jennifer Aniston neuron. You recently published a book called Neuroscience Fiction. But I will go ahead and read the full subtitle, as I think it gives a lot of in- important information about the investigation you do with both science and sci-fi philosophy. So the subtitle is "2001: A Space Odyssey to Inception: How Neuroscience is Transforming Sci-Fi into Reality While Changing Our Beliefs About the Mind, Machines, and What Makes Us Human." Some time ago, I was, I was thinking. I mean. I'm as, as a neuroscientist, I'm quite familiar with the latest, I mean, like the big things that happen in neuroscience, not in all areas, but I know a little bit the, the literature and the big labs doing the, the major discoveries. And at some point I saw, wow, this is not far from what, I don't know, I wouldn't even say decades, like maybe five years ago, we would have considered science fiction and or 10 years ago. And I was wondering, do people know about that? Because we see all these movies and we think this is impossible, but do people know that this is actually not that far from being reality? And I thought that was, that was fascinating to, to revisit all these ideas that were up to I mean, a few years ago, only the realm of science fiction movies, and to start discussing, well, actually, how far are we from, from achieving that? But then I thought, There's something missing because it's a nice story to tell. I mean, it's nice to show how 
what was fiction a few years ago is becoming reality. But for me, the book to make sense, I mean, it has to go a bit deeper. And then I started looking a bit more and thinking about about, about how do different people thought about this question over centuries. And I realized as well, at the end, we are just facing the same question that big philosophers faced, I don't know, centuries ago. Looking into, I mean, looking at science fiction from a very modern perspective and then seeing how science fiction is becoming a reality and how this is helping us to answer some of the big, big philosophy questions. So there are questions in philosophy that have been, uh, they have been around for ages, for centuries, I will say, and I think we're starting to answer them. And the epilogue of the book, I mean, related to philosophy, is, is basically arguing that we are living a revolution not only in neuroscience, but in philosophy. I think philosophy is changing now. Among some of these bigger intersectional questions is the one of uh, mind-body dualism. So traditionally, the philosophy of mind-body dualism states that the mind is non-physical and there's a gap between the mind and the body. So they're separable. As neuroscience has developed over the past decades, neuroscientists are starting to reject this mind-body philosophy, stating rather that the brain is the mind, and the brain is fully connected to the body with neurons that fire and can cause a calf muscle to contract or a person to raise their hand. So you had some interesting commentaries about closing the gap between the mind, the, bo- the body, the soul, uh, the brain. So, so can, can some of the current advancements in, in um, neuroscience, can, can it explain these type of things the, uh, and close these gaps, especially the seemingly intangible kind of mysterious entities um, and how they govern our behavior, consciousness, and awareness? I think so. And I think it's, I mean... We are all kind of like born and raised as dualists. So we, I don't know, we we tend to believe that there's a mind that is something intangible that somehow interacts with the brain by some, in some mysterious way. And even if we know in science that this is not the case, I mean that there are many arguments to, I mean to rule this out. We still think in terms of a dualistic view, even if I know that what I do is the product of of brain activity. I mean it's just my neurons firing. I will still unconsciously Think of a mind making me do, making me take some decisions, choosing the words that I'm saying now, choosing to talk about the card and not about something else, and and so on. So this is somehow inherent in 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 our in our thoughts. And I think the revolution is to really start thinking in terms of neurons and their activity and their connections and and our interactions with the environment and how this somehow makes all what we what we experience and. To go into the philosophical connotations of that, I think it's a challenge because if I tell you, well, I mean, our mind is nothing more than the product of, of our neurons. Fine. I think all scientists will agree with that. But if we start thinking deeper about that, what this implies, all the connotations of that, then it gets very interesting. One of the big questions that swirls around any neuroscience discussion touching on philosophy has to be the question of free will. In light of the duality theory being put aside by many neuroscientists, what then can you say about free will and individual's ability to make decisions? Yeah, it's all it's all linked. I mean, all these big philosophy challenges, I mean, they are linked to some extent. I mean, it all starts, I mean, like the big, big question of philosophy, I think, of philosophy and neuroscience in the 20th century was consciousness. So consciousness, I think, is linked to identity because the most interesting challenge of consciousness is how can I be aware of myself, my own existence, right? So then I get into identity and what makes me be what what I am. I mean, why, I mean, can I replicate myself into a clone or maybe into a machine that has transistor replicating my neurons and with the same connectivity of my brain, will this be me? And if yes, how come that I'm here and not there where, where the machine is? So all these challenges in philosophy, somehow they are linked and what I find fascinating is that we are slowly getting with some experimental designs to, to start tackling these questions. These more abstract philosophical and sci-fi inspired questions about free will and uploading one's thoughts and consciousness are important to discuss here, especially as advances get us closer to these possibilities. But they are also only relevant if the foundational work allows for these advances. As Dr. Kiroga suggested, 
Neuroscience is indeed in a revolutionary period, and the individual pieces are starting to be better understood. Now we're going to hear Dr. Kiroga unpack one of these important pieces on a topic he has written several papers about, the Jennifer Aniston neuron. Okay, so first, just to clarify, these neurons, they do not recognize faces. I think face recognition is, is done earlier. They are just reading the information of visual perceptual areas that they say, well, actually, the person in front of you is Jennifer Aniston or whoever it is, because also the neurons respond to the name of the person. So they're not doing any feature detection to recognize faces. They're just getting the gist of, of the stimulus, which is in this case is this particular person. And I think we have this type of representation by these neurons, which I like to call concept cells, for memory functions. I think they're crucial to form, to form memories. And the way we discovered these neurons was well, when I, I came to Caltech as, as a Sloan Fellow, I started in neuroscience. I had a very unique opportunity to start doing recordings in, in patients, in humans. And these are patients that they are implanted with intracranial electrodes for clinical reasons. And there are many technical details, but basically they try to cure them from epilepsy because they cannot be cured by medication. And since they are considering resecting an area of the brain, that is the one starting the seizures, they will implant electrodes in the brain to try to localize where the seizures come from. And this gives us the opportunity to record single neurons. And then the first thing I, I did, it was, I mean, I just started showing pictures and I saw one neuron falling to Jennifer Aniston. And then I said, well, but is the neuron really falling to Jennifer Aniston or maybe to this particular picture that I show for whatever reason? Then I went to Google Images, looked for many pictures of Jennifer Aniston and saw that the neuron fired to whatever picture of Jennifer Aniston I show. And it's called the Jennifer Aniston neuron because that was actually the first case. I mean, that was the first one I saw. And as I found this one, and then I found another one far into Halle Berry, another one to any picture of Oprah Winfrey, and Luke Skywalker, and you name it. So we found dozens and dozens of these neurons. And basically, the, the point of all these experiments is to show that in an area that we know that is crucial for memory, which is called hippocampus, we have a representation of concepts. And why is that? Well, because we tend to remember concepts and association between concepts and the details, they tend to be lost. So just following on, what happens if we remove the neurons from the hippocampus? Are we are losing the, the, the recognitions or the, the, the concept in the humans? No, I don't think so. Because we know that patients with lesions in the hippocampus, and there's a very famous one called HM, uh, who, I mean, who has his hippocampus removed in the 1950s, um, they still recognize things they knew from before. So HM could still recognize his mother, for example. So recognition is not done in the hippocampus. We also know that semantic memories, memories of facts, I mean, they're also not in the hippocampus because HM knew who his mother was. You know, oh, that's my mother. And he knew semantic information. What, what you define consciousness? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm very good at escaping this type of <laughs> uh, consciousness. You can call, like, for example, the fact of being aware. Like, I'm conscious because I'm not sleeping or I'm not in coma. Consciousness, you can call, I'm aware of seeing you, I mean, in, in, in front of me doing this, this Skype conversation. But it can be recognition, which is what I said before, or it can be, if, imagine that we know since many years and I remember meeting you many times or bringing all these experiences together. I mean, and for me, this is also consciousness. Actually, something like that is what we call qualia, which is a big word in consciousness. So mm -hmm. depending on what you refer to, I mean, you can define it differently. When thinking about consciousness, some may pose the question, is consciousness what makes us different from animal species? If so, which element of our consciousness? Humans have created language, math, and society. Could this be the keys to understanding human consciousness? You mentioned many things. You mentioned language, you mentioned creativity, you mentioned human intelligence and so on. And something that is really puzzling me, especially about writing this book, because in this book I went to science fiction and you have these movies like Planet of the Apes and then you wonder why, why are we so much more intelligent than chimpanzees? And chimpanzees are very intelligent. There's no doubt about it. I mean, they're very, very smart, but we're clearly way, way much more intelligent. So, but what is the difference? Because the brain of the chimpanzee is not that small. It's just one third of the human brain. However, I mean, having a brain three times larger make, it, make us like an among us amount more intelligent. So there has to be something different. There has to be some coding principles that are different between us and a chimpanzee. It's not just a matter of 
number of neurons, there has to be something radically different. And I was wondering, what, why? What, what is the difference? And you mentioned it. I think one difference is language, and it's the key difference. But it's not language because of social factors only, because we can communicate, we can transmit knowledge and so on. I think it's because language gives you kind of like the tools to think in terms of abstractions. So whenever I say a noun, if I say horse, I mean, that's a typical example I give. I'm not telling you about a particular horse of a given color or of a given shape or age or whatever. I'm just talking about the concept horse. And I can, I can make some argument involving a horse and then you are not distracted by these details. So the fact that your thoughts, that the basic of your thoughts starts with abstractions, which is language, I mean, given by language, allows you to get kind of like an, a meta level of thoughts. I mean, you can make very clearly, very easily association between thoughts, between concepts, that maybe another animal will be much more limited because it doesn't have this abstraction level and cannot play with this puzzle in the way we, we can play, cannot get these, these concepts to play around like that. And this is very special for me, and it touched my science a lot, because I actually found neurons that they do encode these concepts, these abstractions. So the neuron of Jennifer Aniston didn't fire to a particular picture, it fired to her. So if you want to make an association between Jennifer Aniston or whatever concept you want and something else, it's very easy for me, because I just get one concept, get the other, and I just create a link. But if I don't have this representation, then it's much harder. And now I finish with that. I wonder if what you're saying is even more fundamental to culture, because I think culture, it's a higher concept than the basic level of conceptual understanding. So you're saying potentially that the fundamental unit of intelligence comes from this ability to conceptualize and then the ability to verbalize the concepts through language. The fact that you remember things in terms of abstractions helps you a lot. I mean, actually, what defines our thoughts, our memory, is that we forget a lot. We get rid of many details. And a monkey maybe does not do that, or a rat does not do that, as we do. And I think that's defined the way we think, and, and the, I think it's a key aspect. I wouldn't say the only aspect, but it's a key aspect of our intelligence. kind of want it to kind of ask you a little more about the paper um, that was recently published in cell um, regarding the single neuron coding of identity in the human hippocampal formation. So before this paper, what was the question that you were trying to resolve? And with the data observed in this paper, what kind of are the key takeaways? Actually, it's, it's the last paper of a series of, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 papers where we describe different aspects of these concept cells. So I told you that these neurons, they will fire, one of these neurons fired to many different pictures of Jennifer Aniston, another one fired to many different pictures of Halle Berry and, and so on. Now the question we had in mind when we ran this study was, okay, the neuron fires to all the pictures of Jennifer Aniston, but does it fire in exactly the same way or is it different? So it will fire more to one picture compared to another. So if you see, I mean, like, let's put up numbers. I will exaggerate, but so to make the idea clear. So if you present any picture of any person, then you know will fire, say, with one hertz. I mean, one time a second, then you know will fire. Now, if you present Jennifer Aniston, the, then you know will fire not with one hertz, will go to 10 hertz. But maybe sometimes it goes to 10, sometimes goes to 12, sometimes to 15. I mean, it's clearly higher than all the other pictures. But the question was, in from the fire of the neuron, do I have information of which picture has been presented? And that's a technical question, but I think mm -hmm. it has some connotations because if you do have this information, means that this memory area, the hippocampus, where these neurons are, they also have information about the specific pictures. So they are also encoding some of these details that we discuss about. And the answer was like the vast majority of these neurons do not have this information at all. So basically, if I show many different pictures of Jennifer Aniston, let's keep putting Jennifer Aniston as, a, as an example. From the firing of this neuron, of this concept cell, I cannot tell which picture it was. The information is gone. So the point is then that these neurons, they focus on the concepts and all the information related to details, like which specific picture it is, is completely gone. So that's the main take home message of, of this paper. Looking at the big picture, how can these strategies and evolving technologies be implemented for neurological diseases such as dementia and epilepsy? I mean, I, I have been asked a lot this question, and 
I think my answer goes along these lines. I mean, basically, sometimes the solution to one of the big problems doesn't come from studies that they typically, that they specifically try to address this problem. Sometimes from basic science, you somehow get, although it's not was not planned at the beginning, you get the solution for some very practical problem. Now, my answer will not satisfy you, I mean, because it's, it will be very vague, but I think it's, it's important. So the key, the key link for me is with Alzheimer's, because I'm, I'm, I'm telling you about the neural mechanism for, I mean, of human memories, how these memories work. And then you will say, well, can somehow this information help to cure Alzheimer's patients? And to be honest, I don't know. I mean, I don't have any specific idea of how this can be applied to Alzheimer's. But having said that, I will argue that if you want to cure Alzheimer's or if you want to understand what, I mean, how to treat these patients, first you have to understand what goes wrong. And before that, you have to understand how does the brain works in normal subjects? I mean, how, how do humans store memories or form memories or retrieve memories and so on? And we still don't know that. We are starting to scratch the surface. And I think the moment we have some more I mean, deep understanding on how memories are encoded by neurons in the human brain, then we have, I think, a much better chance to understand, to say, well, what can we do to try to maybe delay this process? So maybe we are not talking about curing Alzheimer's because it's, it's, I mean, it's something that, I mean, it's genetic or it's too tough and hopefully we will do it, but maybe <laughs> that will take too long. But maybe we say, well, but now we understand, now we understand how memories work. How, what can we do to try to delay this process? And that would be huge. I'm also curious in terms of applications, aside from the clinical potential applications in understanding how neurons work and how memories work, what about looking further into the technological space and thinking about, is it possible to upload memory or download memories after we start understanding how memories work a little bit? Because now you're still studying deeply about these conceptual neurons and is it possible to encode them artificially into the human brain? It's funny, you know, because when I wrote the book, I was playing around with these ideas. And it was so like playing around. I'm, I write about science fiction and it's, I mean, it's a book. So I just let my, my imagination go and I actually thought about how could somebody do an experiment to try to induce these neurons. And I, when I wrote the book, I thought, well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the idea. I mean, I wouldn't do it because I cannot do it right now, but I think it could work. I will give you an answer that is still relatively vague because I won't tell you we have to do this, 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 and that. But I think there's something that, I mean, that is very important and that is more like a generic thing, a generic view. Artificial intelligence for me has done like major, major, huge steps in the last, I don't know, seven years or so, especially since deep neural networks have started to become like the prima donna of, of computational and neuroscience. And it's well deserved. I think is there's no critic in that. I think it's really well deserved. I think they're doing amazing stuff. Um, but at the same time, I think there's something that is remarkable. And it's like, well, we are finding these neurons in humans. And it seems that no other species have these neurons, as far as we know again. So, and this is, I think artificial intelligence or the people doing artificial intelligence might be intrigued. To, I mean, I might be interested to look at to, into that with more detail. Because so far, the way the near, I mean, all these artificial intelligence were not all, but most of them work, is that they, they, be, they, they get very good at solving specific tasks. I mean, they can beat us at chess, they can beat us at go, they can beat us at recognizing pictures or faces or so on. But what they lack is general intelligence. So this means the ability to transfer knowledge from one particular thing into another completely different one. And I'm not the first one saying it. I mean, and the one that was arguing this for decades was Marvin Minsky, who was like the grandfather of artificial intelligence. Now, again, if you want to transfer knowledge from one area to another, from one context to another, the best you can have is a representation that is conceptual, that is context independent. This is, this is outstanding. Thank you so much for your time. 
Thank you. It was, I think, very, very uh, thoughtful discussion and very interesting. And I think uh, our listen listeners are going to appreciate all of this knowledge and the gap between mind and the brain and what makes us human. And I think this is, this is a beautiful discussion to have. Thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Science Rehashed. Thank you to Dr. Rudy Tenzi for providing us with the music for our intro. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can also visit our website at sciencerehashed.com. We would also like to thank all the members of Science Rehashed who contributed their time in making Science Rehashed possible. This includes our writers, Madura Lolikar and Kara Brenner, our marketing director, Carla Diavanzo, our sound editors, Tavi Pollard, Jared Warsoff, and Sophia Nastri, our assistant, Rebecca Solison, our creative director, Emma Brand, our producer, Shuang Zhang, and our business development director, Vichy Lo. Our show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Please subscribe and recommend our podcast to your friends and send us your comments and feedback. Thanks for listening.